And good morning, UPPC. It's so good to see you, and for those who are joining in person, it's ever just, this is the gift, it's the best part of our whole week, because, uh, you know, we, those of us who are in ministry, we are in, into ministry because we love people. <laughs> we don't love cameras, sorry, folks at home, or red dots in the back of a room. We love people, and so it's so good to see you and be with you this morning, and so thanks for joining us. I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to Nehemiah chapter 5. Question I'm, I'm preoccupied with, how does Nehemiah draw the trust and the following of a divided people? How does he gain their trust to lead them to unprecedented movements of God in the people of God, in the city of God, during unprecedented times? We live in unprecedented times. I think we all could agree to this. But uh, one of the realities that we're going to see in Nehemiah is that part of his trust was that he was stewarding what God had given him Faithfully, okay, faithfully. One of the character qualities of our church that I know many of you have such great respect for and, and love of for UPPC is a core code value that we discerned in 2014, and it's simply these two words, we share. We share. Now, uh, I was uh, uh, board chair of an organization that was uh, working uh, pri- pri- predominantly with young leaders in Tacoma, And I remember going to various churches throughout our region, and this isn't, I'll be careful here, this isn't a uh, critique and criticism of our brothers and sisters in other congregations, but what was shocking to me was the inability of churches in our region to be able to support things outside the walls of their church. Okay, are you hearing me? Okay. It was astonishing to me because we were trying to gain support from local churches, especially churches who were trying to raise up young leaders in their own contexts. And what I realized was that this whole concept of we share as the body of Christ, we share with each other, but we also share outside the walls to the benefit of the city and for God's flourishing in our city. That is not a universal concept among churches. In fact, it's, it's rare to invest so much in uh, partner ministries and what God is doing in our region. And so what I realized was you can, you can talk the talk, but... Can you walk the walk? Now, you, you can preach one thing, but do you practice it? Do you actually do what uh, you preach? Okay? When it comes to the lordship of Jesus in our collective lives, in our individual lives, does the rubber meet the road? That's a serious question. And a passage we're going to go back to in the story of Nehemiah, and when we, we, we jumped over, is to see how Nehemiah practiced what he preached. He practiced what, he's, what he preached, and it had everything to do with his convictions on stewardship and sharing. This is fascinating to me. And as you remember from the previous uh, reading that Rob shared with us, is that the leaders, the governors of that region, Judah and Jerusalem in particular, were oppressing the very people that were called to bless and lead. They were charging uh, inordinate uh, interest rates on uh, homes and properties and fields, They were enslaving their very own people, even people part of their family in the family of Israel. They were patting their own pockets, charging all sorts of fees and interest. So Nehemiah calls it out publicly and then models something different. See if you can resonate with this part of the story and watch how he gains the trust of the people he's called to lead. Okay, Starting with uh, verse 14. It says, Moreover, from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, until his 32nd year, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. Now, I'm just going to pause there for a moment. What we're seeing here is the author is going to give a break in the story and give perspective on the 12 years that he was given leadership over Judah, okay? And during that time, he's going to tell us, this is how I led, this is how I behaved, this is how I helped our people flourish, Okay, so it's a little bit of a break in the story. We're getting a flashback from the author who's writing it in uh, his time. And verse 15 says this, But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekel of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistance also lorded lorded it over the people. But out of reverence for God, I did not act like that did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. 
Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table, as well as those who came to us from the surrounding nations. Each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me. And every 10 days, an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. That's quite a party, right? But this is the key. In spite of all this, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor, allotted to him, because the demands were heavy on these people. And then verse 19. Remember, this is all kind of a conversation with God. Remember me with favor, my God, for I, all I have done for these people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I love this. In fact, I want to just uh, do something a little different today. And those of you who love numbers and just tracking along to know when my sermon's coming to a close, this will help you. Uh, five things that I just read in this that are meaningful to me and I think stand out and help us in understanding the character of Nehemiah and the fundamental for a church and a people like us who are a part of a community that holds the strong conviction we share. Okay? We share. And these five things are going to be like stones that we build our own wall around this code and the mortar that it takes to keep embodying this value. And some of them are going to speak to times we find ourselves in today uh, with the COVID and uh, all of the restrictions we're experiencing and are about to experience, okay? So the first one is this, and this is what I find fascinating about Nehemiah and is a character quality that I appreciate, and it's this. Ask serious questions and tell the truth. Ask each other serious questions and tell the truth. Let me just ask you, do you have people in your life, do you have settings where people have permission to ask you serious questions? Serious questions. Let me tell you what this looks like. Uh, even at the very beginning of, of Nehemiah chapter 1, we see something happening with him. Uh, right before, it's actually far before this exchange and this story that he's recounting, is it begins, this whole story begins with Nehemiah asking serious questions and people telling the truth. Way back in chapter 1, he has a small conversation with his brother Hanani, you remember, and some other men, and he doesn't dilly-dally, they don't talk about the sports scores in Susa, instead they're, they're cutting to the quick, and Nehemiah asks direct questions pointed questions. He says, in effect, how is it really going with the family? How are things really going back in our hometown of Jerusalem? And these men open up and they tell the truth. It's going terribly. It's really bad. They say, we're in a lot of trouble. It's all falling apart. The city's in ruins. No one's flourishing. And chapter one tells us that Nehemiah sat down and he wept at that news. These sorts of serious questions and truthful answers continue all the way through chapter 5 when he confronts the governors of Judah and even the priests themselves. He wasn't afraid of serious questions and truthful answers. You know, one of the best things I think we can do for each other in this time that we're in is to ask serious questions and be honest with each other. For some people, this is a time that you can manage, and you're, you're managing. I don't know if anybody is really flourishing, maybe a few, but there are others who aren't managing so well, and they need friends, they need people who they can be honest with. And to the question of, how is it really going for you? If someone asks you that kind of question, tell the truth. I walked into a meeting this week feeling completely overwhelmed by a laundry list of challenges and problems and worries, the pandemic's rise in cases, the impact on our church, some of our family needs, a physical ailment I'm dealing with still, and the season ahead financially. And so I shared what was on my heart because someone asked, how's it really going with you, Aaron? And we prayed together. I really appreciated just that outlet to be able to share honestly about how it really is going. Now let me, let me direct this in a way that I think is important for this week and, and f the next week, is that I want to cut to the chase on a question for us as a church and everyone that's joining us, even though if, those of you who are online. We're in a very important two months for our church. 
where we're going to be considering, each of us, every family does this, you can see, and I'm inviting, if you haven't done this before, is to consider this, is to consider what your financial commitment will be to the day-in and day-out commitments of this church and the ministry uh, needs. We call this our commitment season, and uh, it's, a, it's a time where we plan ahead and the elders can start working on what the next year of ministry will look like. Now, let me just give you some of the good news. The good news is up until this point, first 10 months of this calendar year, we have received 97% of our budgeted expected income and giving from our church body. That is exceptional in these times. Okay. So that's good news. Can I, I can't see your smiles, but I hope you're smiling. That's good news, right? 97%. And the challenge is to continue that because November and December are the most important months in our ministry calendar, is to continue that, right? right. To not back off, not pull the, the foot off the pedal. doesn't matter what the news is about the economy or, or what's going on with, with the governor's announcement, is how do we keep that positive, healthy, sustaining ministry resource, okay? But also, what does it look like to to look ahead into the future. One of my dear uh, seminary professors back in 2007, I remember him saying this in a worship class, and he said this directly to the students. I did not understand the weight of what he was describing, but he said these words. He says, someone has to stand in this square, right here, okay? Wherever the pulpit is in the church, or wherever there's, a, there's the place where a communicator stands, someone has to stand in this square and ask serious questions. Are you following me? Ask serious questions about, is the lordship of Jesus really putting rubber to the road in our lives? Is it evident in how we are living with each other? Is it evident in how we steward what God has given us? That was the key question for Nehemiah and the key question for the people who would choose to follow him. What is your commitment to the collective mission in these unprecedented times. Nehemiah asked that question to the people of Israel. Nehemiah's uh, response from the people was, let's see you lead us, right? What is your commitment to the mission of UPPC in these unprecedented times? And we've got to tell the truth. Maybe it's just to ask this question is, how's your generosity meter right now, right? And if I'm honest, I'll just be really vulnerable if I'm honest, when I'm anxious, I get really protective. And when things aren't certain, my generosity meter just tanks. I'm not really open to new opportunities. I'm cautious, and my faith meter tends to decline. I'm closed off to sharing. That's the honest truth. But that tendency in me violates my calling to live in faith, that God provides everything for me, God provides everything for us, and our calling to trust God and our mandate as God's people to not just take our self-interest as the first priority, but the interest of the people. That's what I love about this passage. Nehemiah's desire to put his faith rubber to the road. And he doesn't take what he could justifiably take and increase his assets and all that was coming from King Artaxerxes. It was his. It was allotted to the governor. He could take it all. He could build himself a mansion. He could feed all the incoming leaders from other nations out of the governor's assets. But instead, I'm sorry, out of Artaxerxes' assets that were given to the governor. But instead, he shared those things with the people. And out of his own assets, he feeds them with, did you hear that word, that the choice sheep, the best sheep? Twelve years he did this. And I love how he points out, he says, but out of reverence for God, I did not act like that, like the previous governors. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. You know, maybe it's that you have to sit down with your spouse or uh, someone in your small group and just ask serious questions. How's it going with you? in this area of lordship and generosity. And I know there's all sorts of aspects to this in our lives, but to ask serious questions and to tell the truth, that is what the best of community does. It calls us to a higher level of following Jesus, and our community flourishes as a result. 
So how's your generosity doing these days? How's your devotion to the work of the kingdom right now? Okay, that's the first one. Let me quickly go through a couple others here. I was going to spend some time on that one. Second one is pray and see the needs. I loved how if you, if you read Nehemiah all the way through, and I'm not, I'm not sure anyone has ever done that in this, in this camp, but if you ever get a chance to do it, underline all the times that Nehemiah is praying and then God directs Nehemiah and the people of God to the needs around them. It's part of the storyline and arc of this passage and this uh, book is that time and again, the response of Nehemiah to the needs he becomes aware of is to pray and then give to the needs of those in the city who needed it most to supply the needs of his people. This is, by the way, also part of the story arc of Ezra, who was a key leader in that time too. I think it's fair to say the Bible suggests the reason God moved so powerfully in the people of God and in this time was because their heart broke for the needy among them. And I believe this to my, the core of my being. The longer that you pray and that you are in community with others, the more your heart will break for the things that break the heart of God. That your heart starts to break for the things that break God's heart. What if every time we heard another dire report on the news, our response was to reframe and send another prayer Lord, meet the needs of those people suffering most right now. Father, give wisdom to the decision makers. Give uh, endurance to the, to the hospital workers and our, the medical workers right now. Right? Maybe even, could I even just suggest this? Maybe it looks like fasting. That means skipping a meal or not eating for a whole day. But maybe just once uh, a week taking one meal fasting so that you can identify with somebody who's lost their job or remind yourself of the hunger pangs to be faithful in prayer for those who are in need right now. Pray and see the needs, okay? Pray and see the needs. And then the third thing that I think is interesting is, and we didn't, we didn't go back to chapter four, but there's actually a point in this part of the story where Nehemiah recognizes that at one point in his life, he charged interest on people he was charged to lead and bless and protect. And he confesses it. He confesses his own tendency towards the very thing that he's going to judge and condemn in chapter 5. And I think it's not a bad thing for us to just consider confessing our part in the problem. Our part in the problem. And, and I'm going to just speak directly to the mess that we're in in our country. Okay? Uh, around COVID-19 and uh, our response. The truth is that part of the reason we're in this mess today in our country is because a lot of us in our country, I'm not going to say in this room necessarily because I don't know that for certain, but, but a lot of us are not able to deny ourselves much of anything. And I, I only know this because I talk with people who live in other countries that are, we have relationships with and they're fascinated by why is it that, that America can't practice some self-restraint and discipline and we're having this you know, uh, really difficult problem reigning in uh, the, the spread. And I don't want to get into any arguments with anyone, and I know that this is really controversial for some folks, but you'd be hard-pressed to convince me that the problems we are facing in this pandemic aren't exacerbated by our incessant appetites and the independence mindset. And it wasn't just those political leaders in D.C. over there in, or, or, or the, the governors in Jew, Jerusalem over there. We spent... We took more than we needed. We let our a collective, we let our need for comfort, maybe even our pride, run away with us. And it's important that we confess that. Why is Nehemiah able to lead the recovery of his people? I think it's partly because he's realistic, and this is the point here, he's realistic about the sin inside himself. He's realistic about the sin inside himself. And that sin contributed towards the breakdown of the nation that he loves and the people he loves. If we in the Christian community could do that, if we could model that kind of realism and accountability and even repentance, instead of blaming, I'm so tired of people blaming others. We know what's refreshing to me is once in a while, can we just get honest and say, you know what, I think I'm part of the problem, right? I'm just going to be honest about my own culpability in 
the problems we face as opposed to the easy route, which is to scapegoat and blame someone else, right? And we would be doing one of the best things in the worst of times if we just confess our part in the problem. You know, if, if it comes to lack of resources that God wants for our church or the churches in Tacoma, we've got to confess that sometimes we're part of that problem, is that we have appetites that keep us from living fully into what God wants. I have to confess that in my own heart. I hope we all could have the honesty to do that. Confess our part in the problem. Fourth is, is really kind of natural. I'm going to move quickly through these, but uh, connect our gifts with others' needs. I just love that Nehemiah had gifts. He had resources. He was able to connect it with the needs, not only of the people uh, in Jerusalem that had hunger needs and provisional needs, but also even how he hosted his own uh, parties and gatherings, right? And one of the striking things that Nehemiah did in his nation's time of crisis was to call upon people throughout the book, but leading all the way through chapter 12, was to call on people to use their gifts in service to the recovery effort, which absolutely included the welfare of the people in Jerusalem, the poor, the oppressed, those who had been hit worst, those who were uh, taken advantage of financially. And from chapter 2 on, we, when he got to Jerusalem, Nehemiah pulled people together in groups, encouraging them to use their gifts to support one another in the rebuilding effort so that everyone could flourish, not just those who were wealthy, those who had assets or resources. It was for everyone. What does that look like at UPC? I'll just I'll give you an example. Is that uh, One of the just, I think, heartbeat arms of our church is Families Limited Network, which many of you can see that, that it operates out of our property here uh, at UPPC, and it's its own 501c3, but the food bank there was something that early on, but even continuing into this fall, was something that our leaders just felt like, this is a crucial time to double down and, and resource and support and do whatever we can to support the work that's happening there because their people are being hit so hard uh, by job loss and uh, not having... Um, uh, they're experiencing food poverty, you name it. And so we all felt led as leaders to just double down on that commitment to Families Limited Network and to show our, our support for Jim Lineweaver and the board. And, and so what if we, just let me just ask this question, what if we all doubled down? We could perhaps help someone network to find a job or even offer a job to a member of the church who needed it. And we're aware of people who are looking for work. We have the ability to give to all of us to give to the Deacons Fund, which is a unique fund that helps uh, people in our congregation who are experiencing loss, loss of jobs, maybe difficulty paying rent or bills because of that, is to help them uh, uh, recover and to, to cover the expenses during a crisis for them. One of the best things we might do also in the days ahead is to come up with a way that our church can connect needs with need meters. And so when you are in the midst of community, community with other people, is how can you connect them with people who have the ability to meet that need? Okay? Connect your gifts with others' needs. It's amazing what you'll see God do when you have that mindset. Okay? And then lastly, this is, uh, this is part of the arc of the Old Testament, but particularly in Nehemiah, uh, is to tithe. And next week, I'm going to ask us to bring our commitment cards. This is going to be unique. I don't know if we're going to have services next week. We might have to be completely online. We don't know what the governor's going to say at 11. But, but, uh, but this is crucial for us, is for us to, to all give a commitment, a pledge, so to speak, of what we want God to do through our giving and our collective giving in 2021. I think it's fair to say 2021 is a crucial year. You know, the adrenaline is wearing off. Long-term exhaustion is setting in, and this is why the practice of a tithe was God's mandate so that we didn't get comfortable not giving a tithe. And in the third chapter of the book of Malachi, we read perhaps the most counterintuitive strategy for economic recovery in all of the Bible. But the prophet of God calls people to make a priority of bringing their whole tithe to the temple so it could be dispersed, their first fruits so it could be dispersed to the people of God. That was one-tenth, one-tenth of their income. And there are two reasons for that. The obvious one is that the work of the temple is especially important in difficult times. I don't think we've seen more need than we have in the last 10 or, or six, seven months here at EPPC. Uh, but the second reason is that God promises to open the floodgates of his resources to those who put their trust in him. And many of us have 
tried letting our stewardship of time, talent, and treasure be guided by the clamoring voices out there, or the news, or the anxiety, or the fear-mongering, what would it look like to let it be guided by the voice of God in here and in here? So those are just five spiritual stones I think God invites us to lay down and mortar with faith in the midst of these difficult times. It's not an easy thing to do this. And of course, it takes a whole community. It takes serious questions and honest answers. And oh, how, friends, you have taught me this at UPPC in my experience of this community. Not once have I doubted our response in faith to God's call for us to share. And you taught me what a church looks like when it makes this value front and center and puts rubber to the road of faith with what we preach and to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. You've always stepped up, and it's why your elders and pastors can dream about ministry in 2021 and beyond is because this church has always been faithful. We've been able to pivot this year partly because we didn't have to be doing crisis management around our finances. And so I want to thank you for that. And then as a little uh, bit of a, a, I think, a sweet storytelling, I want to introduce this video that's going to share a little bit of what our youth and children's ministries had to do to pivot this year. One of our major aspects of ministry here at EPPC is our love of students. And uh, they had to do extraordinary work to do, you know, youth and children's work doesn't, doesn't work very well digitally. It's about relationships one-on-one, and I love the heart of our uh, children and youth staff and volunteers, and we're going to hear just a little bit from them, and then I'm going to close with some prayer, okay? Take a look. At first, it was absolutely miserable when things shut down. You know, in, in March, we thought this would be done in April. In April, we thought surely by June. We were faced with the questions of how do we talk to students, How do we meet up with students? Because meeting up with students is one of the main things that we do. Try doing a youth group on Zoom. It does not go well. I remember having conversations with them, telling them that we could not go on senior mission. I've never seen kids cry so hard uh, when they found out that could not happen. They had lost prom, they lost graduation, now they lost senior mission. Something that they had looked forward to for seven, eight years. That was one of our big concerns was where can we serve kids in a way that we haven't had to before in midst a season of loss. I was nervous about the economic impact this was going to have on our staff and I had many sleepless nights to be honest with you. That caused me anxiety and a lot of prayer. Parents are so overwhelmed right now and I feel like whatever we can do to let them know that we are praying for them, where we remember them. The thing that I hope for most when it comes to youth is that they'll have some sort of experience uh, of God in whatever we're doing, whether it be basketball, whether it be getting coffee, whether it be going on hikes. And so to bring them some kind of joy for that senior, uh, for that graduation ceremony that we did was absolutely incredible. You saw them hanging out of their sunroofs, cheering on. It was almost better than an actual graduation. So we we jumped into filming lots of stuff. We pivoted with preschool and started filming our chapel skits. They don't realize all the things that they're missing out on or the changes. And so it's been amazing to be able to pivot in ways to keep things as familiar as they can be with, uh, we brought the pumpkin patch to the fellowship hall and the kids were able to come and pick out their pumpkins there. Um, We were able to transform the lodge into an obstacle course for trick or treating. Um, And again, to just know that we could do those things and not have to be worried. The question never for us was never about money. It was about kids and making sure that they felt celebrated and they felt valued. And boy, we got so many letters from kids. The superintendent drove by and thanked us for what we did. I mean, uh, that was one of the coolest pivots that we made this summer. We were able to provide um, some lunches as well as snacks because unfortunately some people forgot those. Uh, And we were also able to bring water so they were hydrated on the hikes. And then afterwards we would have a treat, uh, go out for Froyo or hit up some Ben and Jerry's ice cream, whatever the case might be. There was one guy who went back two times for ice cream and I was able to say, hey, it's okay, we can cover that. Um, A scoop of ice cream from Ben and Jerry's isn't going to break the bank and it's because of you, it's because of the church that we're able to walk in that light. 
So we opened the door that first Wednesday in September with this nervous energy. And all of a sudden, we watched kids just pour into our building. And then the energy of this entire place completely changed. Having fun in this day and age is something that's it's hard to find. Uh, it's found in the simple things. I had kids come up to me with tears in their eyes saying thank you because I've not seen anybody. Um, one of the things that's been really cool for me during this season is that I grew up here. I am a Sunset Christian Preschool alumni and <laughs> grew up all throughout my formative years here at UPPC and am a direct result of the contributions of a faithful congregation and many adults who believed in what the work was that was being done here. I never worry that I can't do something for families because there's no worry about the funding for it. I have been blown away in all honesty of, of the generosity of our congregation to remain faithful and keep giving. I mean, I was on my knees and just to see our congregation step up to the plate and take care of our people meant a lot to me and it meant that we got to keep uh, caring for kids um, in our congregation. So. I am lucky and just so excited to be able to be a part of that now giving back and pouring into the lives of the young people here. We are just so blessed. That's a wonderful picture, I think, of the gratitude of people who are working on the front lines with Julie and Robin and Lexi and Rob and so many others. We could close uh, this time with prayer with me. Uh, Lord, uh, we're grateful. I'm grateful for our church and how collectively we can we can be a part of this dream, and uh, we can steward what you've given us. And so would you help us once again to ask serious questions about what we lay before you and to hold loosely to things of this world and instead to treasure and give priority to the things of your kingdom and what you're doing now. Uh, bless your people in that prayer, I ask, and I pray this in your name and everyone said, amen, amen.